Mubarak. Thank you for your patience. I, I think I was in the wrong uh, room for a second. Uh, so I look forward, inshallah, to delivering the Jumma Khutbah today. My name is Aris Salim. I'm happy to be here. Uh, let's start, inshallah. In the Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu and Astainuhu and Astafiru, and I would be lahim in Shururi and Fusina, Women say ye are Tia Malina, Women ye are Dihilla who fell a mudilla, Women you lil who fell a hadiella, Washadu Allah, Ilaha illa law who hatahula, Sharikala, Washadu and Muhammad and Abduhu were a solo, Sallahu, Alehi, wa Allah, Alehi, was a happy he was seldom. All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the universe, and peace and blessings be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, today's uh, Juma Khutbah, I wanted to begin with a hadith that some of you perhaps have come across. I came across it actually at one of uh, Usama Malik's uh, presentations here at Muslim Space. Uh, and it really struck me and reminded me of um, a thesis that I had done as a part of my Master of Divinity program. And the topic, inshallah, today will be uh, around the issue of mental health, mental illness. And the hadith I'm speaking of uh, appears in Sahih Muslim. So inshallah, I'll re recite it for you all and offer a few reflections in that regard. So it's reported by Anas that a woman who had an illness in her mind said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have a problem or I have a need. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O oh, Mother of so and so, show me any road you like so I can take care of your need. So he went privately with her in one of the streets until she was relieved of her problem, meaning he sat with her, talked with her until she felt satisfied. Um, and in regard to the way this hadith was brought up um, by Usama, he, he was highlighting the idea of um, particularly in the series uh, on Shama'il that you all are running, that this is a moment to be attuned to how the prophet cared for those around him, how he was in touch with the people around him, how easy it was to approach him, and sort of speaking to his everyday lived character and painting that portrait for us. Um, but what struck me in particular was this issue of mental illness um, that's sort of um, implied in this hadith, the Arabic goes, An anis anna imra'atan kana fi aqliha shay'un. So there was in her intellect, kana fi aqliha a thing, shay'un, or maybe something off. Faqalat ya Rasulullah. So she says to the Messenger of God, Inni li alayka haja, I have for you a need. And so the hadith goes on. But just to highlight that it's sort of like, you know, it's alluded to that there was something off, you know, but it's, it's not clear particularly what that is. So, uh, and mental illness would be a good translation, but I just wanted to provide that for clarity. Um, what I really wanted to come to was regardless of how the society saw this woman, you know, as perhaps often her intellect impaired in some respect or um, had some sort of mental illness, there's this impetus in the prophet to humanize her. And the ways in which it's done, I found very beautiful, particularly that the prophet first begins by sort of emphasizing her agency. So he asks her to show him a place where she feels comfortable, where she can take him so he can listen to her. And I thought that was empowering just as a first mode of providing care that you're, you're, if, if there's someone that's marginalized in society, the approach being that you kind of restore agency or you emphasize that agency for that person. Um, how would you like me to take care of you? And so I wanted to highlight that as one part of this um, hadith uh, that stuck out to me. And just as a mode of reflecting on how we provide care to one another, care to ourselves as well, um, and care to folks that are marginalized, whether it be ourselves in, in different respects and degrees in society or others. Um, the, the other um, part that I want to highlight is just kind of the way this hadith paints the picture. It's very sort of nonchalant in the way that this lady comes to him, asks for help, and he kind of goes to the side and helps her. And there's no sort of um, 
sense of threatening that's happening for the prophet. Oh, she's weird. Oh, this or that. There's no sort of stigma that we, we might, you know, come across uh, more commonly today. Um, some of which, you know, we can understand where that sort of stigma around mental health comes from, particularly with so much going on in the world right now and the tragedies that result um, from just unsafe environments. But I think the unfair aspect of some of these tragedies is that unconsciously or perhaps even, you know, alluded to in the way that media presents the, the stories to us is that somehow mental illness uh, is, you know, a sort of conflated with this idea of something or someone very dangerous to us as people or as quote unquote normal people. And I think that stigma is not something you see in the attitude of the prophet or in the way that he deals with this person. And just as a way of highlighting how sort of he humanizes this woman in the way that he takes care of her versus somehow in our context where mental health has this stigma and someone you know that gets this label of you know a mental illness or gets categorized in that way becomes sort of somewhat alien and distant from us sort of less accessible we don't really understand what's going on you know it's somehow it takes on this alien and inhuman character or picture in our minds and just uh, highlighting this hadith as a way of stepping back from that way of, of looking upon um, um, people that may have mental health struggles, whether our own mental health struggles, because it also affects the way we look upon ourselves. Um, the last piece of this hadith that I sort of wanted to highlight as it pertains to taking care of one another, humanizing one another, is this kind of, you know, uh, spontaneous way this woman is able to approach the prophet um, and the location being sort of in flux, um, which to me sort of reminded me of how we have this sort of hospital infrastructure and very sort of, um, you know, everything to a certain extent, you know, I'm not saying this is absolute truth, but there's some uh, relative truth to the idea that we live very compartmentalized lives and we sort of relegate things to their boxes um, but here, and, and including care, you know, and including in the hospital context. So here you have, let's say, this person that's in need of care, they get to choose sort of where that care happens. The location is sort of in flux, you know, it can be in a street, it can be on the side. And this I just lift up to highlight how, you know, the possibilities of what healing could look like, you know, and that it doesn't have to always be in these boxed in ways that we're used to providing care, but it could happen in the street, you know? And I think we're often reminded by that, by Hadith from the Prophet about his emphasis on smiling, how smiling, smiling is a charity, um, that we could be um, extensions of providing that level of care. And I'm not talking about, you know, you know, providing care to someone who's uh, severely un unwell and we don't, we're not equipped to do that kind of thing. That, that's not really what I'm getting at. So just to be clear, but just that sense of the possibilities of caring for one another, you know, in less compartmentalized ways or being open to even caring for one another at times where we might not otherwise sort of be programmed to be in that mode of thought, oh, I'm going for my walk right now, oh, I'm doing X task right now. And, you know, you get kind of hyper-focused, missing opportunities to do those small acts of kindness to respond to someone's need. So those are sort of the main um, reflections that I had in regards to this hadith. Um, and I kind of want to shift slightly to how this kind of reminded me of the thesis that I undertook uh, during my Master of Divinity and uh, uh, kind of introduce you to some of the reflections that I had there. And just to kind of preface this piece of it, I, I want to say that um, what I offer in my thesis is definitely an intellectual exercise. It's sort of creative and it's one way to look at the picture. It's by no means... Um, you know, the only way to look at it, but I hope that I can, you know, kind of defend the case I'm trying to make. Um, so in my thesis, I covered a figure in the development of early uh, Sufism, early Tasawwuf. This is in the 10th century AD. Um, and the, the person or figure that I picked was Abu Bakr al-Shibli. Abu Bakr al-Shibli um, died 334 after Hijri, a 945 AD. 
So we're in the 10th century in the Baghdad area in Iraq or present day Iraq. And um, Abu Bakr Shibli was a student of another famous figure named Junaid al-Baghdadi who dies uh, like maybe 20 to 25 years before or 30, 35 uh, years prior to him. Uh, and Junaid al-Baghdadi is sort of considered the father of this more, you know, what in ac academics called like sober Sufism. So it's a more kind of uh, low key to so as opposed to let's say what you might imagine with the word like dervishes or drunken Sufism is the word that is used sometimes. Um, and he's a student of his, but I picked his example and I sort of looked at it in reference to mental health in the modern context and the way that we provide care for mental health and mental illness in the modern context. Um, and I found him to be a relevant figure because he was sort of this eccentric Sufi that sort of um, pushed against the norms of society at times, perhaps even pushed against, um, you know, his teacher in the sense of his teacher was more quietist in certain ways, whereas he was more pronounced socially and he wasn't afraid to speak out and look awkward and this kind of thing. Um, and what's more particular to, to this character in relation to the conversation around mental health today is that um, he had a unique relationship to madness itself in that there's been reports around him that he was confined to the asylum in Baghdad of his time um, at different periods, perhaps once, maybe more than once. Um, and that he self-identified with Janun, which is the Arabic term for madness. So I found him sort of a relevant figure to use as a, as a, as a kind of entry point to reflect on how we think of madness today and kind of do a compare and contrast. I'm not gonna go through all of the, you know, what I did in my thesis, but just to lift up a few points that I think might be of benefit in the way we think about me mental illness today, I wanna sort of launch off by just focusing on one of his sayings, which might kind of strike you as uh, sort of controversial, but some folks, you know, because of his sort of eccentric and um, you could say, antinomian, anti-normative ways, accused him of, of being mad. So Ashibli responded to them, may God increase me in my madness and you in your sanity. May Allah increase me in my janoon and you in your siha, your sanity. And he kind of says this, um, I'm not providing a lot of context because often with these sayings, there isn't so much context with these early figures, some of them, they don't have as, meant, as much narrative as they have, let's say, sayings that have been preserved. Um, there is another sort of incident where he, you know, it actually takes place at the asylum. But this is sort of, I think, a different incident. So here, I kind of want to talk a little bit about how he sort of flips these categories on their head. So even though folks are accusing him of being mad, he sees something sort of worthwhile in his madness for him to be doing this prayer, you know, and of course he could be speaking sarcastically in the sense that you know, what you think is madness is not madness to me, what you perceive as awkward or weird or something that's undesirable from a religious perspective, for me, that's desirable, for me, that's doing something for me. So me, you know, I'll be to my ways and you be to yours, kind of uh, a kind of a, you know, flippant remark that he makes. Um, but I think what's valuable is the way that sort of we think of madness today, which is very, you know, in this framework of labels and categorization, if you are somewhat familiar with psychiatry today, you will have like a, a book that categorizes it called the DSM. And you have the various symptom lists and then, okay, this puts you in this bucket, you know, schizophrenic, let's say, or bipolar or so on and so forth. And it's very different in the way that he sort of takes us out of uh, where he pushes, you know, the people in his time to sort of consider that whatever his altered state of mind is, may have some value beyond illness, you know, beyond this uh, very particular way of looking at things, or at least uh, th that it could somehow be desirable. And, you know, jumping a little bit further to sort of looking at how in the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is also accused in his time of being mad or being janoon. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and sort of steps in and says to the, through revelation that 
your companion or this companion of yours is not crazy. He's not mad. This is only like a clear revelation from God. And um, sort of the second way, that, what I'm trying to highlight is here is that when people accuse others of being mad, even historically, as we, we're seeing in the case of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there can be this way of using it as a way of sort of weaponizing it against marginalized voices or trying to sort of dismiss unwanted truths by accusing someone of madness, you know, and in the case of the Prophet, Allah sort of defends him, and this is something clear to all of us uh, who, who sort of identify as Muslim, um, but in the case of Shibli, he sort of also defends himself by flipping these categories and sort of going beyond that. So now I sort of just want to bring this into something more concrete for you. Um, the thesis that I sort of constructed um, was a sort of critique on a certain way, a certain impact that I think modern psychiatry has in the way that we think about mental illness. So I think that because madness in our time has largely been defined and confined by categorization and labels, um, it sort of promotes this sense of, you know, reifies these illnesses into illness identities that become you know, synonymous with who we are as people. So, you know, I am bipolar, I am schizophrenic, you know, this is what people are generally told. And it's seen as a sign of acceptance when you're able to say, identify with these labels. And I think there is something good about these labels in that if there's something going on that you don't have a good understanding of and lets you sort of highlight what that is and get um, medication and therapy for it that you might need, that, I think that's the element of the structure and apparatus of doing things that's beneficial and good, and I'm not sort of speaking out against that. But what I am saying is that when we have these labels, it can tend to chip away at the way, at this sort of humanizing impetus that we saw in the hadith earlier that I quoted. This sense of looking beyond these labels, seeing the person fully as a human being, not as just a walking illness, not just as a label, but being able to have an eye, even if that sort of these labels are operational in our society or in our modes of getting healing, that they don't end up actually defining us fully. Um, and also, I think that once we do define ourselves fully by these labels or, you know, too rigidly, that can also be an impediment to finding meaning in our experiences that go beyond the scientific categorization. It can also be a detriment to seeing, uh, or let's say an obstacle to seeing a cure or feeling a cure in our experiences. When, you know, you become synonymous with an illness, those we love become synonymous with illnesses, yeah. or, you know, or, you know, or we sort of project it unknowingly into the moments of care that we provide to um, folks that are struggling with mental health. Um, the final point, and inshallah, I'll conclude because I know I'm reaching towards the end of my discussion. I wanted to lift. Um, well, let me let me pause here, inshallah, and then I'll do that after for the second uh, khutbah. <laughs> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So the final point that I sort of wanted to raise, I'll do so through a hadith of the Prophet. Um, um, one of, well actually before I do that, I, I want to mention that um, one of the sort of final critiques that I want to share um, um, in regards to the way that we do things now is that there is somewhat of this sense of, um, you know, a chronic illness in our understanding of mental illness. You know, it's something that can't quite be cured. It's kind of stuck. Rather, it can only be managed, it can simply be managed. You can't be fully rid of it. Um, and I want to sort of juxtapose that sentiment to something that the Prophet Muhammad said. This is also a report that appears in Sahih Muslim. So it said that Jabir reported that the messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, every disease has a cure. If a cure is applied to the disease, 
If a cure is applied to the disease, it is relieved by the permission of Allah Almighty. So from the beginning, every disease has a cure. If a cure is applied to the disease, it is relieved by the permission of Allah Almighty. So in this hadith, what I saw juxtaposed to the sense of like managing mental illness uh, and sort of, you know, you're chronically stuck in that state or in, with that condition, this sort of alternative that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is offering, I feel, is this sense of perpetual hope that one can hold. And I don't mean to promote a kind of delusional hope uh, that prevents us from accept, accepting certain realities, but a kind of hope that is, you might link it or associate with Husn of Ban holding a good opinion of God at all times. That if we were to hold on to this sense of hope and the possibility of cure, and to look beyond some of these um, illnesses, uh, sorry, these illness labels and categories to, to maybe have them operational, but have an eye beyond them, um, that we might actually find potential for further cures, further meaning, further clarity about these things. That if we have just a, a slightly better disposition towards it in terms of hope and possibility that, you know, scientific possibilities uh, that can address these things may emerge that we haven't previously thought about because of our sort of limited way of, of looking at things. So I think essentially this hadith encourages us to sort of live out our full potential as people who may be involved in healing professions, but also those that are seeking healing. Um, and, and I think that's, yeah, inshallah, I think that's the final point that I wanted to make in, in regards to this discussion. So, inshallah, let's uh, conclude with that. Barakallah fikum. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahima wa ala ali Ibrahima inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama barakta ala Ibrahima wa ala ali Ibrahima inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma khfir lil mu'minin wal mu'minat. Allahumma khfir lil muslimin wal muslimat. Al mu'minin wal mu'minat. الأحياء منهم والأموات ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار Allah I ask you to bless us uh, on this blessed day of yours I ask you to get us good in this life and in the Akhirah Ya Allah I ask, I ask you for afiyah for well-being I ask you for uh, physical and mental health for all of us uh, I ask you for protection for all of our families all of our friends all of our parents for those that are gathered here and for those that are uh, absent, Allah bless this ummah, guide us all to be um, thoughtful nurturers and healers of one another. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve us all and grant us khair, inshallah. Bi rahmatika ya rahim rahimeen.